Hi, everybody. My name is David Martins. I'm the director at the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, and welcome to In the House Live. Uh, In the House is a, um, a project, I guess, if you will, of uh, VAHC. It's our ongoing conversation about the topic of affordable housing in Vermont, but an ongoing conversation from the perspective of different communities within our state. Last time uh, we broadcast from here, we spoke about the impact of affordable housing on early childhood development. You can see on our website uh, the uh, short, shorter uh, video versions uh, that are not live, that are just recorded uh, of in the house. Uh, you'll see in the next coming month we'll be talking about how housing impacts folks living with HIV and AIDS. In November we talked about uh, veterans. And today uh, we have with us Emily Hancock, who is a member of the class of 2023 at UVM. And Emily and I are going to be talking about affordable housing and young people, specifically college students and recent grads, and uh, kind of the relationship, yep. right, between young people and the housing crisis. So, Emily, why don't you tell uh, Tell us a little bit about you. Where do you, are you from Vermont originally? I am actually originally from Kansas. Kansas. So I am a long way away from home. I applied to a bunch of schools trying to just get out of the Midwest. Um, and then UVM ended up giving me the most like in financial aid package. And I was like, excellent, Vermont is the best state. Definitely going there. <laughs> <laughs> Not trying to be in um, massive amounts of debt when I graduate. Um, I think my perspective is probably a little bit different than a lot of other college students at um, UVM. I am like paying for my own school and paying for my rent and paying for all the things myself. And so that's kind of just like a little bit of a disconnect between me and some of my peers I find a lot of the time in which their parents like help them with school and help them with rent. Um, they don't like understand the drasticness of the way high rents affect like housing people and the way that that affects the Burlington community overall because it's not like a burden that they bear themselves. They're not facing those costs. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, and as you know, the housing market here is insanely tight and yes. especially in Chittenden County and in Burlington. Mm -hmm. It's at one point, I think two or one point, I don't, I'm not sure what the decimal point is. It doesn't matter. <laughs> That's insanely low that there's not even apartments available, never mind apartments that are affordable, because yep. there's none available, so everybody knows that they can charge whatever they want for yep. an apartment, and someone will pay it, right? Exactly. And one of the things that, like, thinking, like, from my perspective myself, like, thinking of, like, oh, if UVM offered, like, more scholarship money to ha help, like, offset those costs, but then all that's going to do is just increase prices, because you're just increasing, like, more money into the system that already has a lot of money pouring into it. So like that's not a like viable answer because that's all that's going to do is just like increase the prices. So now, did you? So you live in off-campus housing? Yes. In an apartment. Yep. What was your experience trying to find one? Um, so I actually experienced a little bit of homelessness in May um, of 2020 when I came back to Vermont. Um, my job had it like extended me back and asked me to come back after getting furloughed. And I was like, I make a lot better money in Vermont than I do in Kansas, where the minimum wage there is seven twenty-five an hour. Mm. I remember in high school, like lifeguarding and teaching swim lessons and making like nine dollars. And I was like, I'm so cool. Look at all the money that I'm making. And then I got here and I was like, oh, <laughs> this isn't even minimum wage here. Um, but for me, it's like I was very, very lucky with the place that I found. I. Um, have two roommates and I only pay $500 a month to have this like little like closet space to live in But it's like what I can afford and it's like what pro like keeps me housed um, It's does just that include utilities or no 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 so $1,500 altogether a month For the whole for the whole place. No, it's, it's a little bit more for the other people because they have larger rooms Oh, okay. than I do. so it's even more expensive. Yeah, <laughs> no definitely definitely not cheap. I it's also like very far away from campus, and that is one of the like key things that I think might solve a lot of issues in de-densifying Burlington overall. UVM shuttles does not offer shuttles off campus unless it's like late at night. But if I'm trying to get to my morning class, it would be really nice to have a shuttle 
to get me to and from there. Their main focus for providing those shuttles late at night is for people like partying. They don't want people to drive while under the influence of anything mm -hmm. and to provide them a safe way to get home late at night, which I think is like amazing and should continue to be done. But I'm not trying to party, I'm just trying to go to class. <laughs> the exact opposite of partying. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe finding a way to offer more shuttles away from campus. So if you're offering shuttles like to Winooski or offering shuttles like to Colchester, just pretty much any area surrounding Burlington that you're allowing like a campus bus with a consistent schedule to get to, you'd be able to like be more comfortable living and housing further away from campus. And then that decreases the like, I guess, workload on Burlington overall and helps to de-densify that. It's interesting, you know, well, I, I mentioned that we have some versions of In the House that are not live, that are, no. you know, just recorded, and uh, the one that will be coming out uh, probably next week or the week after, I'm talking to the director at VT Cares, which is the HIV AIDS organization mm -hmm. here, and one of the things that we talk about, a little spoiler, mm -hmm. one of the things that we talk about is how people come to Vermont who are living with HIV and AIDS because of the phenomenal care that is available in Vermont. Yes. For dealing with HIV AIDS, then they get here, and they can't find anywhere to live. Yep. And so some folks, you know, come here seeking that fantastic care, and uh, you know they end up living in that car, or they end up right. And yeah. so it's interesting, you know, that we have these things that draw people here. Yeah. And you know, school, the job market, healthcare. like alone. I so I currently have four jobs, which <laughs> <laughs> I it's it's a lot. But uh, with one of them, I know that there are people that had like considered like working here in Vermont and they could not find housing. And so they went back to Philadelphia. And that's just like, it's so much affordable, more affordable to live there mm -hmm. that like they literally couldn't find housing here. And I also know students like who have withdrawn from UVM because finding housing was too much of a challenge mm -hmm. from them. I think like this year, especially looking at how dense on-campus housing is. Um, the enrollment statistics are free to everyone online on UVM's website if you look them up. And it's about 500 more students this year alone than it was last year due to deferrals. And looking at that and thinking, okay, they're on campus now, they'll be on campus again next semester, but then the year after that, they're all hitting Burlington. I will be graduated by then, but I just like, and thinking about trying to find housing in that market with 500 more people if the housing market's already this tight and more people and more people are trying to move to Vermont, it's gonna, we should do things now to build mm -hmm. housing before it gets like too late. And I think UVM really needs to find more housing on campus and actually make that housing affordable. One of the things that like drives up these prices is it's actually cheaper for students to like live off campus. You're paying roughly, it, when I calculated it out, it's like around $1,100 to share a room with someone and to share a bathroom with like 10 people, have no kitchen, and that doesn't even include the meal plan on top of all of that. So you're looking at like, okay, I'm paying over $1,100 to live on campus, share a room with someone, not even have my like own bathroom that I know is being cleaned regularly. And then you have all of that and you're like, okay, I can live in an apartment by myself and pay $800. That's not unreasonable. You're saving $300 and you're getting so much more out of it. So if UVM were to like drastically cut the cost of its on-campus housing, then it's gonna seem like a more attractive option. And then on top of that, they also need to make sure they're not over-enrolling students. Like this fall, they need to like only accept a very small amount of students compared to last year. Otherwise, there's literally not gonna be anywhere to house them. Looking on their website and calculating and tabulating through the availability of on-campus housing, there were about 5,600 students who were living on campus as compiled first years and sophomores. And then there's about 5,800 like occupancy housing that they have for them on campus. If like UVM's done what it's continually done, which is just to increase enrollment, increase enrollment, and increase enrollment, they're gonna run out of housing for their students and no juniors and seniors can live on campus. It's unbelievable. I, <clears throat> so I live in Winooski yeah. and uh, a buddy of mine lives, I, I'm on one side of the circle and he's on the other side and so and sometimes we'll get together for dinner or something. And uh, 
he'll sometimes joke that, you know, we jokingly call Winooski the Brooklyn of Burlington, mm -hmm. and yet, and it's pretty accurate also because the prices are just like Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> and we, yeah. we kind of like, you know, and he'll frequently say, this is Winooski, Vermont, it's not New York City, yeah. you know? But really, that's what we've sort of arrived at. Yeah. I was talking to, um, well, just in the course of my work, I frequently talk to lawmakers, and uh, and a topic that's that's come up as I've been talking about uh, talking about this up, upcoming discussion with you was um, the idea that even beyond college, so now we want people to start a life here, we want people to stay for the long term, and how does a, how on earth does a recent college grad? realistically start a life here when those, so now school's out of the way, yeah. and now we're trying to put that degree to work, yep. and the and people working multiple jobs to, you know, and and it's, uh, and still barely making it. Yeah. It's a real, it's a very real problem. I think in other cities, like after you graduate college, the opportunity to live by yourself in a situation like in a one bedroom mm -hmm. unit by yourself. That is not a realistic reality. If you're making minimum wage in a minimum wage job, you will have to have roommates in your like 30s. And I think that's a big discouragement of people like wanting to live here is they're like, if I'm in my 30s and I have roommates, how am I supposed to like start having a life outside of this like college mindset? Mm -hmm. And the other thing is I think like, I understand that like, Economically, there's a sense where it makes sense for parents to try to like take care of their kids and do everything they can for them. But I think it's like if your parents are paying your rent for you, it's essentially the same as like you're living at home. And I think like having that mindset with people, because that's like definitely like looked down upon if you're living with your parents, which like should not be at all. Like it's completely not affordable and if you have an option where you're like I'm literally saving thousands of dollars like mm -hmm. in one year it, it's a it's a tough situation for sure for sure now you mentioned you have four jobs but you actually have five you just don't get paid for the fifth one you're an advocate <laughs> <laughs> right so I first yeah. uh, sort of what brought you here today as you know to catch everybody up who's watching is that I had uh, been talking about so VAHC, uh, I, and I know you know, and I, but I don't know if uh, everyone who's watching knows, VAHC is a coalition of over 90 organizations who work together uh, in advocacy, education, and outreach to try and increase accessibility to safe, decent, affordable housing uh, here in Vermont. And part of the coalition, we, you know, we, we're getting ready right now, going into the legislative session, which will start in January, and so we put together legislative priorities for you know causes that we want to advocate for next year we're going to have a more sort of uh, once I'm more settled in my role we're going to have sort of more of a process of really giving real voice to our members to really come together uh, maybe right at the end of the of the, of the session we're going into now to start talking about the next session and really be a part of putting policy in and really you know not just saying well I want to support this bill that's already in but that how to all of us as a coalition help contribute to shaping the needed policies. And a voice that's missing at the table is young people. And I think that voice needs to be there and lawmakers mm -hmm. agree that it's a missing voice and it's a voice that they want to hear from. And, uh, and so I was talking about this with our steering committee and someone said, oh, I was at this community meeting and this college student spoke and she was so eloquent and all this. So I tracked down the recording. <laughs> And then, I, and then I talked to the organizer to get the contact information and all this stuff. Uh, and I watched you speak, and, and you were very passionate, very articulate, as everyone is uh, hearing tonight, too. And so then in talking, I found out that you've actually been f kind of formally working on this, right? So tell us a little bit about what your project has kind of been. So right now I've been trying, so I qualify for work study, and I've been trying to get that as my funding for working on just like understanding how the pandemic has exacerbated the effects of houselessness. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like, I don't know, that's a very like near and dear issue in my heart after experiencing that myself. It's a very stressful situation and especially like trying to be a student on top of that, you just, you can't set yourself up for success in that situation. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. 
and you've done some like round table stuff among the student body, right? Yeah. So like you've done some formal things with yeah. other college students. Just trying to like listen to their perspectives and just trying to like give them a space to be heard because I feel like a lot of times like their voices are just like, not that they aren't heard, but it's just they don't have the time to like actively go out and say like, this really is a tough situation for me. This is a really tough situation that I'm in. I know one of the things in a post I made on Front Porch Forum, I was list getting um, responses from medical students, getting responses from graduate students. So this isn't just an undergraduate issue, mm -hmm. like medical students leaving UVM Medical School because they can't afford to live here, graduate students switching to different programs because they can't afford to live here, or it's just too much of a headache. The fact that you have to look like over seven months out to be able to even find housing for the like upcoming year kind of boggles my mind. Like. It is not like that in other cities, but it's also, everyone is having this issue with the pandemic. I was just reading an article earlier today about UMass, UMass Amherst and how they are experiencing like one of the exact same things. They over-enrolled the amount of students they're able to house, and then that's leading to like constriction on the like community around them, and then that's like displacing them from housing. What's really frustrating is if you don't come from some sort of like financial backing, Burlington isn't somewhere you can live anymore. Mm. It's slowly like morphing into a place that like you have to have serious money if you're gonna try to live here affordably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I know, you know, I'm not from here either. I'm from Rhode Island yeah. and I just moved here in July. And I got really lucky finding my spot. Uh, it yeah. was really, I was stalking Craigslist, yeah. literally. I yep. mean, I'd be sitting in meetings for my, yep. for my previous job, r refreshing the page. Yeah. And the second a new thing would pop up, if it wasn't a scam, yep. it was it was some apartment that was, you know, I remember one that it talked about like great city views and it showed a picture of this living room, this living room window with a skyline. And I said, there's not a single skyline in Vermont. Where's, yeah. that, where's that picture taken? Yeah. Uh, but once you get past the scams, yeah. um, to find a, uh, something that's available yep. and then reasonable is almost impossible. And I had a friend who uh, his... Uh, I'd been I'd spent some time up here uh, a year ago and made a couple of friends I stayed in touch with and one of them found out that I was playing move back he was very mm -hmm. excited and uh, on the floor above him uh, an apartment was coming available yep. and so he said you know hey if you if you're interested you know I'll connect so he connected me with the landlord mm -hmm. really nice guy and now I'm again I'm five hours away right yeah and um, so I get the the video tour and all that he hadn't listed it yet yep. and I thought to myself. I'm a little concerned about fitting my furniture in there. Like, yeah. it's kind of small, you know? And uh, my buddy was like, well, you know, I mean, there's not a lot of room, but like, you know, it's, yeah. and I know that the place is well kept and because mm -hmm. I'd been to my friend's place, yeah. and, you know, and, uh, and, but the price that he was asking was a couple of hundred dollars a month more than what I'm paying wh where I am, where I have much more space. Yeah. and. And I just thought to myself, oh my goodness. Yep. <laughs> I don't think that people, I think that sometimes when we talk about affordable housing, people just think of homelessness. Yeah. And they don't necessarily connect all the dots and recognize that the issue of affordable housing is an actual named issue. Yeah. And that it really and truly does apply to all of us. Yeah. You know? And I think that's like the case with like renting, but also like home ownership. This is a perspective that I didn't even like think about until I was sitting in the forum with Kesha Ram that she was hosting where I spoke about my, um, spoke previously, but like how homeowners, like you can't do that in Burlington. It's, it's insane. There was a woman who talked about how she had sold her house and made like, I think 150% profit on the sale of her house. And then looking for a different home in Burlington, she couldn't afford to live there because prices had changed that drastically. And that like looking for housing, it's like, I've been looking for housing with my partner. And I was like, oh, I looked at this and I like sent it to him by checking it three hours later, it was already off the market. So it's a very, very volatile situation, both for renting and for housing. And affordable housing, like trying to transition people into home ownership and not just have it be renting. And I think the demographic breakdown of Burlington, it's like either 60 or 70% renting and then 30, 40% like home ownership. Mm -hmm. So it's a very rent driven market, which is very different than I would say a lot of other cities. What have you, have you had any experience of, in your conversation with other college mm -hmm. students, 
um, or even just in your lived experience yeah. as a college student, in, uh, what do you know about sort of the quality of the places that kids are living in? Are they living in dumps? Yes. Yeah. I would say they definitely are. The ideal situation is that they're trying to live as close to campus as possible, which makes sense because that's where you're spending like eight, nine, ten hours of your day on campus. You want to be close Hopefully. enough. <laughs> you want to be close enough to your house that way you're able to come home, maybe eat lunch, maybe grab the things that you need to set yourself up for success. Um, and so specifically like the areas in the like Old North End pockets that are extremely close to campus are very, very densely packed with students. Knowing that students are trying to live in that environment, there isn't really a big incentive for landlords to maintain those properties because students will live there regardless because they have to. And I think that, you know, we talked uh, in the last year, in the last legislative session, mm -hmm. Um, we talked a lot about rental housing safety yeah. and quality of, of, of the housing stock. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the bill pertaining to that uh, was passed but was ultimately vetoed. So I think that the conversation is going to continue because the issue continues. And, you know, it just points to another layer, yep. right, of the struggle, that there's not space. The space we do have is expensive. Mm -hmm. And the housing stock is so old. Yep. And... You know, I'm always thinking about how, so if I lived in an apartment where it was costing me a fortune to heat it because yep. every time I ran the heat, I was heating yep. heating the outside. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, to put an air conditioner in the window so I don't sweat to death in the summertime, you know, drives the electric bill up so high, like the anxiety around those expenses, yeah. how the, that impacts is, impacts academic life, or just if the place is a dump or the leaks or the yeah. mold or whatever. All these things take away from a successful academic experience. Yeah, one of the things that I have been looking into is this concept of university approved housing mm -hmm. in which like in order to like rent to students, mm -hmm. you have to make sure you're living in what the university considers like an acceptable like living condition. I think Nebraska and Illinois are two states that have this in place. Um, it would be ideal because then it limits like where college students can rent within the community. But at the same time, like you have something like that already with the redstone lofts on campus. Mm -hmm. And all that's done is just raise the prices. People are paying, I think it's when I recently checked, it was a thousand eighty-five to have one bedroom in a four bedroom unit on the redstone lofts. And to me that's like an insane amount, but again, that's still cheaper than living in the dorm housing. Mm -hmm. So everything is relative to like that baseline price point. It's a it's a very very high rent. <laughs> and those policies around uh, in those other states are around the college having to have some responsibility in making yep. sure the students are living in in decent housing. Yeah. Is that via state some kind of state legislation or how is are, are you familiar with I'm not familiar with that I've just kind of been like looking into what other college towns have done and how they have protected both the local people who are trying to live here and make it a city that's not a hundred and percent like dependent upon the university mm -hmm. and I understand that there's like a lot of animosity between like the people of Burlington and college students and I understand that like we indeed are part of the problem by raising all of the rents with like people from out of state whose parents pay for the rents, driving up the prices. But at the same time, like we also do need somewhere to live. Right. And so I think one of the main issues that would solve that is really just UVM stopping over enrolling the amount of students that it has the capacity to house and that Burlington has the capacity to house. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the only way we're gonna get out of this is as a community. Yeah. Is, and really working together and putting aside any nimbyism that's out there against exactly. some demographics yep. or, you know. As we're here talking tonight, Emily, as you know, uh, we have, hopefully there's some folks gathered at um, Manhattan Pizza and Pub having pizza and young people. And uh, when our broadcast is done, we're gonna talk a little bit, uh, or they're gonna talk there a bit about, well, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do about it, right? And so I hope that uh, both our conversation today and uh, you know, kind of that event serve as the, the first steps towards really kind of formalizing um, a community of young people, people in their 20s trying to uh, get involved and who want to be involved. So there's a lot of opportunities there and a lot of opportunities to bring those ideas to the table at VAHC and then ultimately to the big table in Montpelier where decisions get made. 
I know that like housing growth and the amount of housing being built over the course of the years has like really stagnated and that could just be to a do of availability of space. But I know that there's also a lot of like laws in Burlington just looking at like renovating a specific property, like trying to build any sort of new construction. Mm -hmm. There is like such a like snake-like bureaucratic network that people have to navigate in order to try to find these housing mm -hmm. like like projects to begin with. I I one of the things is like the Vermont Act 250 mm -hmm. in which like enough people like saying that they don't want to like have a, like any sort of construction project go on can prevent it from happening. And I think that affordable housing that like prevents it from ever even being like conceptualized because there's such a stigma on affordable housing, not even like if it was like college students, but just like people who are like needing a place to house their families that have like no affiliation with the university. And I I'm wondering if there's a way to like reword parts of that to prevent affordable housing from always being on the chopping block because you will always have enough people, specifically in Vermont and everywhere that there's like a lot of people who are like, this is a great idea, but just don't put it near me, mm -hmm. which is the not in my backyard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think there is ways, there are ways to do that. And that's exactly why we need those, these voices yep. together at the table. And I think that be a great opportunity, I think, for uh, for college students to um, to come to the table. Not not even just at the state house, even at the local level. Yeah. You know, and the, and a big part of what VHC, you know, as an advocacy organization, you know, we're we're kind of involved and we're talking to people at every level, mm -hmm. and uh, and so we need these college voices at every level. And uh, you, you know, lawmakers and policymakers always say that. The most useful thing that they hear is the testimony of people with lived experience, and you know it's always it, it's it's very easy for some other group to come in and say, well, this is what this group needs, but it's very different for for people to stand up and say, this is what I need, this is what my community needs, and this is what my community's experience has been, and this is the help that we need. I completely 100% agree with that, which is why I feel like at a lot of the tabling events that I've had is I'm just trying to listen to people's stories and listen to their experiences. I always think like stories over surveys is a better way to connect with people to understand actually what's going on. If you have someone fill out a survey that's just like picking and pointing issues, if you listen to them and listen to the like emotional experience that they've been through or like the trauma that they've been through, you can actually help them in a more meaningful way because you understand the full picture and not just a set of data points. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, uh, on a lot of issues, it's very easy for people to become numbers, and it's so important that uh, we start turning numbers back into people, because that's how change humanize happens. Humanize the situation. For sure, that's how change happens. Mm -hmm. Well, Emily, I hope that this conversation is the beginning of a movement. Yes. <laughs> a movement among Burlington's 20-something population that uh, we can together be a part, um, you know, a part of the change. Mm -hmm. So. So anyone out there is watching, if you're a college age person, well, if you're anyone really, but particularly if you're of that uh, college age bracket and you'd like to get involved, you can uh, email me, uh, david at vtaffordablehousing.org, or you can explore our website for more information about our different programs and things that we have going on. Uh, Emily, do you want to throw your email address out there I'll, in case I'll anyone wants to reach out? Um, it's just emilyhancock at uvm.edu. If you need a space to rant about the housing situation both on and off campus, I am here. I'm here to listen. I know a lot of people who have been living on campus have talked about very personal issues like eating disorders that they've faced in like the dining hall situation or the lack of food availability, um, like not having control over their space, not feeling that they can get warm enough during the winter because they cannot afford to raise their heating bills. Situations like these, if you feel like you need to just let it out because it's a very stressful situation and not everyone has the like resources to ha be heard, I'm here. Sounds good. Well, Emily, thank you very much for joining uh, for joining us, and uh, and I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Yes. <laughs>